The temperate rainforests of Aotearoa, New Zealand are home to one uniquely intimidating group of insects. So in our very first species spotlight, let's dive into the undergrowth and explore these spiky nocturnal cricket relatives, known as Weta. Now I'm hoping a few of you will be familiar with my home, the island nation of Aotearoa, New Zealand. This island group is home to a unique ecosystem consisting of birds, reptiles and insects, many of which exist absolutely nowhere else on Earth. In fact, prior to human arrival, New Zealand's only native mammals were bats and marine species that can cross the oceans as New Zealand split from the rest of the world before the extinction of the dinosaurs and the rise of the mammals. Weta, the word, comes from Te Reo Māori, the indigenous language of Aotearoa New Zealand. It's often written without the macrons, which are those little lines of the vowels, but without them, you actually get the Te Reo Māori word for poop, so best keep them there. If you're interested in scientific names, the Greek term Deinocrida is used to describe the giant weta, and this translates to terrible grasshopper, which is supremely fitting. So let's talk about what makes the Weta interesting. Number one, let's start with size. So Weta are often labeled one of the heaviest insects on Earth, specifically one of the five groups of Weta dwarfs the others. This is the fittingly named giant Weta, or Weta Pangantaria Māori. It's a herbivorous species that quite simply grows to about the size of your palm. The heaviest recorded individual was a 71 gram Little Barrier Island giant weta that they normally weigh up to about half that amount. Just for context, a grasshopper typically weighs 0.3 grams, the common house mouse weighs about 19 grams, and a sparrow generally weighs between 24 to 40 grams. Very few insects are, are heavier than this, but they can be significantly heavier such as the Acteon beetle, and its larvae, not the adult, the larvae, can be 200 grams. On top of this, Witta are also covered in weapons. Now, I was 12 years old when I first watched Peter Jackson's 2005 film King Kong on DVD. Up until this point, I had watched it plenty of times on television. It's screened pretty regularly here in New Zealand because it was made here in New Zealand. But there was a difference. It wasn't until I watched the film on DVD that I encountered one particularly terrifying scene featuring giant insects in a pit that was removed from the television version to reduce its rating. It is, uh way too scary to show here on the channel, so I commissioned an artist to illustrate the scene for us, and I think they've done a great job. This is one particular part that stood out to me, when Adrian Brody was covered in what the film refers to as Weta Rex. These creatures, seemingly inspired by the tree Weta of Aotearoa, New Zealand, made for terrifying but also realistic looking insects to add to the cast of movie monsters appearing in the film, In reality, Weta are mostly harmless. Yeah, there are some species that have tusks, and there are some species that have large mandibles, and if they bite you, it can hurt. On top of that, some species will kick with their spiked back legs, but none of these intimidating features will cause lasting damage. At least one species, though, does regurgitate onto predators, which acts as an irritant. There's also this thing at the back of the wetter that's sometimes mistaken for a stinger, but it's actually what's known as an ovipositor, which is an appendage that females use for uh, laying eggs. Despite this array of weapons, these insects can be safely removed from your house in a jar and released back into the outdoors. Wait, 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 Ben, you're telling me that these things come inside your house? Yeah. Yeah, they do. Most commonly, the tree wetter, which I think are the ones that inspired King Kong. 
They will occasionally enter your home as they do commonly live in suburban areas. This likelihood is increased if you have cats, as they will occasionally take Weta and present it as food to their owners in the same way they might do with birds or rodents in other countries. At least the cats that I grew up with um, used to do this, but I wanted to find out if this was a universal experience. So I created a poll and sent it to my very prestigious research panel of whichever friends got back to me within 20 minutes, and it seems to be a pretty common trend actually. This is all first-hand experience, of course, because, like me, the Weta live only in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Weta are what's known as endemic to Aotearoa, New Zealand. A species is labelled endemic when it exists only in one defined place. Now, <laughs> what does that mean? Great question, because it takes into account one defined place, as in humans have defined this place as one place, and the species only lives in that one place. I'm not explaining this very well. Let me start again. Take the example of New Zealand. This country is made up of two main islands, with more than 600 islands in total, and many species of Weta only exist today on a few of those little offshore islands. So, to say Weta only exists natively in New Zealand, is to say that they only exist on anywhere up to 600 islands, which is... Like, that's a lot. But, because we as humans have defined this particular collection of islands as Aotearoa New Zealand, we can say that the Weta only exists in one place. Therefore, it is endemic. This isn't a super important point, just some food for thought surrounding how human definitions work their way into the natural world. So now that that tangent is over, Weta are endemic to Aotearoa New Zealand. They're generally referred to as 70 individual species across five different groups. The first four are all related members of the Anostostomatidae family, which also includes the king crickets of Australia and South Africa, while the cave wetter is from a different family entirely. This family is known as Raphidophoridae, which is a bunch of fun to say, feel free to pause the video and try it out which makes the cave winner far more closely related to the more globally recognized camel crickets and the spider crickets, or sprickets, if you're short on time, I guess. In Te Reo Māori, specifically the cave winner is referred to as tokoriro, though in general people don't tend to differentiate between Anastostosomatidae and Raphidophoridae, and simply refer to all of these animals collectively as weta, because most people couldn't care less. The fact that these species only live on one island set has led to another interesting concept. This is called island gigantism. Island gigantism is a lot like island dwarfism, except the opposite. It's a phenomenon that occurs when an island or a group of islands has a lower number of predators, like Aotearoa New Zealand. Since remaining small is an advantage to herbivores because it allows them to outrun predators, the absence of predators can reduce the pressure to remain small, allowing that species to grow a lot larger than their cousins on larger land masses. Now this island gigantism is not at all an unfamiliar occurrence in New Zealand. Until very recently, these islands were home to the now extinct moa, a group of large bipedal birds, and the extinct poakai, also known as the Haas eagle, which was the largest eagle that we're aware of. This island gigantism also applies to a lot of still living species as well, such as the kakapo, the world's heaviest parrot, and the takahe, the largest member of the rail family. The climate in this region leads to some pretty spectacular evolutionary traits as well. Aotearoa New Zealand is predominantly temperate rainforest. This is a different climate when you think about things like tropical rainforest, which is a lot warmer. These colder rainforests aren't permanently cold, they are warm in summer, but temperatures do decline as you get a lot closer to Antarctica in the south. One place where it does get cold though is in the southern Alps of New Zealand, a large mountain range which makes up the majority of the South Island. Climbing through this mountain range, you might find scurrying under a pile of rocks, one particular alpine wetter with a very interesting superpower.
This is the mountain stone wetter. It's a species of tree wetter found anywhere between 1100 and 1500 meters above sea level, and it's evolved to deal with the dramatic drop in temperature, snow, and high winds that mark this landscape. Each winter, when the temperatures drop to around negative 10 degrees Celsius, the wetter freezes solid. A negative 10 degrees Celsius might not seem that cold to some of you, but wetter, like all insects, are cold-blooded, and they cannot regulate their own body temperature at all, making them very much at the mercy of the elements. During this temperature drop, the mountain stone wetter can withstand 85% of their body water crystallizing for up to 17 days. They remain frozen on the brink of death before thawing as the temperature rises and presumably going about their days, or in their case, nights. They do this by spending their autumn producing amino acids such as proline and sugars such as trehalose, which act as cryoprotectants or substances that protect the biological tissue from freezing. These incredibly unique insects have evolved to make the most of their very isolated environment, spawning a minor movie monster and adding to the prehistoric sense of the rainforests of Aotearoa. And with that, I hope you've enjoyed this species spotlight. I'm Ben the Quasi-Ecologist, this is The Natural World Explored, and until next time, stay curious, friends. They do this by producing amino acids such as proline, and sugars such as trehalo... Tre how, how can I not pronounce this, but I can pronounce ramphoroidae? Oh, maybe I can't.